Today we'll be talking about semiconductors. While pure elemental semiconductors are the metalloids, which exist between the metals and the nonmetals on the periodic table, they can also be produced in compounds, but we won't be getting into too much detail with those. After talking about how semiconductors work, we'll look at a few devices. We won't be able to cover everything, but we'll look at a few important devices and how they work. If we look at the conductivity of some elements and compounds, we can see orders of magnitude difference between the conductors, semiconductors, and insulators. On the top we have metals like silver, aluminum, gold, copper, iron, and platinum. The units on the conductivity are inverse ohm per centimeter. Uh, the ohm, by the way, which is that omega symbol, is the unit of electrical resistance. Uh, in the middle are some semiconductors like germanium, silicon, gallium arsenide, zinc oxide, aluminum, and organic molecule called pentacene. You'll notice also the uh, N sub D and the N sub A after some of them. This is referring to the number density of donors and acceptors. Uh, semiconductors by themselves are pretty poor conductors, as you can see by the very low conductivities. However, by doping the semiconductor with atoms with one more electron, which is a donor, or one less electron, which is an acceptor, the conductivity rises dramatically. Essentially, by adding just the right amount of another element into the silicon or germanium, you can tune the properties of the material and pretty much build any components you want. This is why computer chips are made on pieces of pure silicon. Doping the different areas can produce resistors, capacitors, transistors, and diodes as you need. Also, the density of the pure material, meaning pure silicon or pure germanium, is about 10 to the 22nd per cubic centimeter. So these impurities are on the order of parts per million to parts per thousand. And then on the bottom, we have some insulators like silicon dioxide and aluminum oxide, and also just for good measure, water and hexane. And you can see just how much lower their conductivity values are compared to the conductors and semiconductors. Here's a plot of the resistivity of doped silicon. Uh, the resistivity is just the inverse of the conductivity that we just saw before. So lower resistivity means a higher conductivity. The N-type silicon is doped with phosphorus, and the P-type is doped with boron. As you can see, the dopant density goes from about 10 to the 12th per cubic centimeter, and the resistance is about 10 kiloohm centimeters to less than a milliohm centimeter as the dopant density increases to 10 to the 21st per cubic centimeter. A 1 billion times difference in impurities translates to about a 100 million times change in resistance. So how can we explain the properties of these solid materials? All properties can be explained by looking at the electronic structure of the material. When we were dealing with an atom, the energy levels were very nice and existed at one unique value. However, when you take two atoms to make a molecule, there is a slight little splitting of the energy levels. This goes back to the linear combination of atomic orbitals. However, in this case, we'll be looking at the orbitals on different atoms and not the same atom. If there is constructive interference between the orbital, then you have a lower energy bonding orbital between them. And if there is destructive interference, you'll have a higher energy antibonding orbital between them. The details really aren't important, but as you add more atoms, uh, there will be more and more closely spaced energy levels. This is what happens when you go from one atom of silicon or iron to a large hunk of silicon or iron. By the time you get to a macroscopic sized piece, you'll have discrete energy levels. However, they'll be so closely spaced together that for all intents and purposes, they can be regarded as a continuum. This is why if you look at most metals, uh, they can pretty much reflect any color light um, that bounces off of them, and that makes them look silvery, which makes them a good uh, for mirrors. The band of electrons can transition between many available levels. However, a colored substance has limited options and can only absorb and emit at certain wavelengths. Now, the bands are not a complete continuum from the core to the top. The energy levels arrange themselves in bands and in between these bands are some forbidden zones. The distance between the energy bands are very important in determining what properties the material will have. Also, by tuning the band structures, you can make the materials behave at very large atoms that have energy levels. Transitions between these energy levels can emit light, and this is why you can have light emitting diodes or diode lasers, and they can also absorb light at certain energies, which is why you can have photodiodes or solar cells. So just summarizing. Free atoms have very narrow energy levels, but when you form a solid, the neighboring atoms perturb the energy levels, causing a broadening of the energy levels, which form the allowed energy bands, and between these bands are the band gaps. Also, this is mostly for valence electrons. Core electrons are pretty much unaffected. Now, what makes conductors, semiconductors, and insulators is the size of the band gap between the valence energy band, which is bound to the individual atom, and the conduction band, which is free to move through the bulk solid. Conductors have an overlap between the valence and conduction bands, so electrons are free to move about no matter how hot or cold the metal is. Insulators have a very large gap between the valence and conduction bands, 
So the electrons stay pretty much bound to the local neighborhood and can't travel through the bulk. Uh, semiconductors are between these two extremes. The conduction band is close enough that the few electrons can hop up and make the solid conduct electricity, although very weakly. Now why do electrons jump the gap? The electrons have a thermal distribution analogous to the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution that we saw in gases. Remember when discussing kinetics, a small percentage of molecules are moving fast enough to overcome that activation energy. Similarly here, a small percentage of electrons have enough thermal energy to move into the conduction band. Um, as just a point of reference, um, the average energy at room temperature is about 0.3 electron volts. So semiconductors are very temperature dependent, and anything over you know, an electron volt or so um, is going to uh, start behaving more like an insulator than a semiconductor. If you heat up an insulator, eventually it will start to conduct electricity and act as a semiconductor. Um, but if you also cool down a semiconductor, eventually the energy of the electrons will be too small to get over that small energy band gap and it will behave as an insulator. At absolute zero, all semiconductors would become insulators. You may have seen uh, videos where people liquid nitrogen cool their computer's uh, CPU. Uh, while initially a cooler CPU does allow for faster processing speeds because of the better heat removal, eventually it would get too cold and stop working because the conductivity of your uh, silicon and all the transistors in there would actually drop. Here is a plot of the distribution of energies of electrons in a solid. This is actually called the Fermi-Dirac distribution. On the y-axis is the occupation of the levels, basically what percentage of the spaces that are filled. This is different than the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution because now we have to deal with allowed levels because of the Pauli exclusion principle. And on the x-axis is the energy of the electrons. Uh, e sub f, this is the Fermi level. Essentially this is where the electrons would be if they were just filled up to the top with no thermal distribution. Think of a glass of water. At absolute zero, which is zero Kelvin, uh, the water would be nice and flat, but if you uh, start jostling the water, uh, then the water little droplets start occupying sites at higher energy above the flat water surface. And of course, if the water is above the surface, there must be some spots which are now empty um, below where the flat surface originally was. So here we're looking at the distribution at different temperatures. Absolute zero looks like a step function. Uh, 77 Kelvin, which is the boiling point of liquid nitrogen, uh, and then we also have uh, 300 Kelvin, which is about room temperature, and 1000 Kelvin, which is just really hot. As you can see, as you increase the temperature, the uh, number of electrons which are above that Fermi level, you know, not surprisingly, actually increase. Earlier I mentioned uh, N and P type silicon, which is dependent upon the doping agents. If you look at your periodic table, you'll notice that silicon, just like carbon above it, has four valence electrons. If you dope silicon with an element which has five valence electrons, like arsenic or phosphorus, the atom will insert itself into a position normally reserved for silicon. However, it will only form four bonds with the neighboring silicon atoms. The remaining electron will wander around unclaimed and unloved by the other atoms. This excess electron will be really close to the conduction band energy and can easily move through the solid. This is what they call n-type silicon for negative um, because it has, you know, a extra electrons. On the other hand, we can also dope silicon with an element which has only three valence electrons, like boron. So now, the boron will try and form four bonds, but only has three available. So instead of having a free electron wander around, it has a hole, because it essentially took an electron from the uh, valence band there. The acceptor level is close to the valence band and can take the electron to help the boron atom fully bond, but in the process, a hole is formed. This is called p-type silicon, and it is electron deficient and forms positively charged holes. Now, what is a hole? All right, now we should at this point understand what electrons are, since they are real particles and can be isolated and studied. Holes, on the other hand, act like positively charged electrons, but just make sure you don't confuse them with positrons, because those are the antimatter uh, component of electrons, and they are an entirely different beast. So a simple analogy for a hole is that it kind of acts like an empty seat. So we can observe it, it has properties, it can move around, but in a more accurate sense, a hole is what is called a quasi-particle. Now what is a quasi-particle? It is a low energy excitation of a system which has a well-defined set of quanta numbers and values that you can calculate and measure, and these properties are often associated with isolatable particles. However, with quasi-particles, you can never actually isolate them. Another example of a quasi-particle is the phonon, P-H-O-N-O-N, which is not to be confused with the photon, P-H-O-T-O-N. So a phonon is a quantum of sound, unlike the photon, which is a quantum of light. And the photon, by the way, is a real 
uh, particle, you know, that can be observed and everything. Photons, on the other hand, are quasi-particles. Uh, and the reason uh, the phonon is a quasi-particle is because it can be used to describe how vibrations, which are, you know, just sound waves, travel through a solid. However, without the solid, the phonons do not exist. You know, unlike light, you know, light exists, you know, in the absence of, you know, anything around it. Um, now, you've seen people at uh, sporting events doing the wave. So the wave, in this sense, is kind of like a phonon. You know, it has velocity, it has frequency, it can be measured. Um, however, if you take the crowd away, you know, in other words, you're taking the solid away, um, the wave ceases to be and can't be isolated. So that's the same way you take the solid away. There can't be any phonons there unless you have actual vibrations of that solid. Uh, now, it's also important to note that while I'm referring to these as positively and negatively doped silicon, the entire bulk is still neutral. All right, it's all that... All that is going on here is that the electron or the hole is free to move through the solid, but, you know, if it happens to leave the solid, then, you know, it just needs to be replaced by one which is traveling from behind. All right, now for metals, because the valence and conduction bands overlap, um, only the electrons carry current. There are no holes in, um, in metals. Uh, also, the core electrons are stuck to the nucleus. Uh, they are just too low in energy to make it up to the conduction bands. In semiconductors, both the electrons, which are promoted to the conduction band, and the holes which are in the valence band are mobile. In a way, the holes travel by getting the electrons up to the conduction band. Again, since holes aren't real particles, but just the lack of a particle, they have much greater flexibility and can travel even though they are, you know, just uh, remaining in the valence band. Now, what happens if you put a piece of n-type silicon next to a piece of p-type silicon? Uh, in this case, the electrons and the holes will diffuse into one another for a small distance in what is called the depletion region. Oh, now, when they are manufacturing devices like this, they don't make a piece of n-type silicon and another piece of p-type silicon and then, you know, just stick the two things together. Uh, what they do is have one piece of silicon and then dope the two parts differently. The way they do this is either by having a gas of dopant atoms diffuse into the silicons or by uh, ion implantation where high-energy ions of the dopants are shot into the silicon. Uh, now, both of these processes have to both occur in uh, very low pressure conditions, basically near vacuum. The dopants can be directed by using um, some photolithography techniques, um, which effectively shield some part of the silicon chip from the dopant atoms. In this depletion layer, a voltage forms, uh, which is just a potential difference um, that develops as the electrons and holes diffuse. It won't continue for the entire solid because eventually the voltage will be too strong and bring the electrons and holes back. Uh, think of uh, little kids playing. Uh, they can wander away from the parents, but if they get too far away, you know, the mom is going to yell at them and they have to return. All right, so if I have a, a piece of P-type silicon and a piece of N-type silicon next to each other, what does this form? Uh, it is called a diode. Uh, and diodes are extremely important because they let current travel in one direction, but not in the reverse direction. So a diode is, in a way, like a backflow preventer that you would have on your plumbing in your house. So the whole purpose of the backflow preventer is to make sure that if there's any contamination in your house water supply, it doesn't back up into the city's water supply and contaminate, you know, the water for the entire neighborhood. Um, but here, it's basically just letting, you know, the current travel one way, but not travel um, back there. So as you can see, uh, we have two diodes. Uh, one which has a reverse bias. Essentially, the battery is hooked up backwards, and practically no current will flow. And the other is hooked up with a forward bias, with the battery hooked up correctly, which will allow the current to flow. Remember, the diode will naturally form a voltage difference at the interface. So if you put the diode under reverse bias, you are forcing the electron back into the n-type um, and the holes back into the p-type, and you're increasing the voltage across the diode. The electrons can't travel up the hill, and therefore no current actually flows. Now for the forward biased diode, the electrons are able to travel into the p-type and the holes are able to travel into the n-type. Uh, basically, you've reduced the potential between the two ends of the diode and now the current will actually start flowing. And down below is a plot of the current versus the voltage. For negative voltages, which are reverse biased, very little current, which is only on the order of microamps, will actually be able to flow. And this is just because of thermal fluctuations which will allow some electrons, you know, eventually to just make it into the conduction band. Uh, for positive voltages, uh, which is going to be uh, forward biased, the current rapidly increases and can be on the order of milliamps or, you know, even amps depending on your transistor, um, which is, you know, thousands of times more than the uh, reverse saturation current. All right, here's a little summary of the diode characteristics. All right, so right here is the diode construction. It also notes the uh, conventional current flow. Uh, one note on electrical terminology. 
So even though the electrons are the thing which carry the current and you know the electron would go from a negative voltage to a positive voltage because of the you know negative charge of the electron, uh, the conventional current goes from areas of high voltage to areas of low voltage. It's basically a historical holdover before people realized uh, where the actual uh, carriers of the current were the electrons. Uh, below um, here is the symbol that you would actually see in electrical diagrams. Uh, notice how it looks like an arrow pointing in the direction of the conventional current flow. And on the bottom is how the diode package would appear on the part. The little black bar is used so you know which way to uh, stick it into the circuit. On the right is another representation of the current voltage curve of the diodes. Uh, now diodes cannot take infinite reverse voltages. Eventually the voltage will be so high that the material simply just breaks down. Now usually if this happens, the magic smoke will escape and the diode will be completely dead. However, um, there is a certain class of diodes called Zener diodes, which are designed to have specific reverse uh, breakdown voltages. And these are often used for voltage references and circuits. On the positive voltage side, you'll notice that the diode doesn't turn on immediately at zero volts. Instead, it takes about 0.3 volts for germanium and 0.7 volts for silicon diodes. This is basically the natural potential which develops in the depletion region, uh, which uh, needs to be overcome. All right, and here are some typical current voltage curves for some materials. Notice the different units on each quadrant of the axes. Uh, the positive current are given in amps and the negative currents are given in microamps. The positive voltages are between 0 and 2 volts. The negative voltages are negative down to negative 300 volts. As you can see, the germanium silicon you have pretty typical curves. Also on here is the selenium, which is used more as a dopant and not so much as a pure semiconductor. And also we have here copper one oxide, which you may not have realized it actually does have semiconductor properties. Um, so even though it really isn't used for semiconductor materials today, although there are some specialized applications, historically it was one of the first materials which uh, semiconductor properties were discovered and studied. Now you might be surprised that it wasn't actually silicon, but again you have to realize um, most of the silicon on the earth is in the form of silicon dioxide and getting into pure silicon, not to mention you know very, very pure silicon is actually very difficult. You need very high temperatures, very specialized equipment. So you know when they were doing these experiments back in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, you know having pure silicon was, uh, was a rarity. So uh, they discovered it in many other uh, materials. Um, and actually you can even make uh, solar cells using copper one oxide. Now the efficiencies are very pathetic, so don't you know plan on charging your cell phone with this. Um, but as a proof of concept, they actually do work. And they are still being researched as ways to make very cheap solar cells um, that you know, could potentially be ubiquitous uh, you know, in uh, 10 or 20 years. Now this is probably the one semiconductor you see every day. Every little light inside the computer, the glow on your cell phone, the glow on your laptop monitor, your TV remote, the clock on your microwave, and now um, the very energy efficient light bulbs are all composed of uh, LEDs, which are light emitting diodes. So the color of the LED is determined by the semiconductor used. While most uh, signal diodes are, and those are the ones in your computer chips, are composed of silicon or germanium, um, light emitting diodes use semiconductor compounds such as gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide, gallium neum nitride, gallium arsenide phosphide, silicon carbide, and many others. And these are used to produce a certain color. Again, um, these compounds here have to be doped with other atoms to uh, you know, make them uh, better conductors of electricity. Now the light is actually produced when the holes and the electrons meet in the LED. Uh, note the higher energy photons need a higher voltage to actually be produced. Right, remember visible light photons in the 400 to 700 nanometer region have energies somewhere between 1.8 to 3.1 electron volts. That voltage corresponds to the energy of the band gap. As the electrons go from a higher energy to a lower energy one, the photon is actually released. Uh, one important point when uh, connecting LEDs. Uh, you need to include a resistor um, in series with the LED if you supply several volts across the LED because the currents could actually become too high and then the LED would simply just burn out. So the resistor just limits the current. Generally values of a few hundred ohms for the resistor are sufficient you know, if you just drive it with like a 5 volt uh, DC power supply. Also uh, one thing you may not know is that the LED color comes from the LED itself not the plastic package that it's actually enclosed in. Uh, the coloring is just there to help identify you know, the correct version so you know you're putting the right LED in your circuit before you get very embarrassed because you made all the green ones red. Now if you were to put a diode in a circuit with a sine wave alternating current, which is basically the AC that you have coming out of your wall socket, you know, your 120 volts, 60 hertz, 
um, the rectified output would look just like the positive part of the sine wave, and the negative part would simply just be thrown away. Um, this is called a half-wave rectifier. Essentially, you have made an alternating current, which is going you know, back and forth and back and forth, into a direct current, which just travels in one direction. However, it is a very crappy direct current, uh, since while the current is all traveling in one direction, it is very, very uneven. Um, to solve this problem, you can actually put a capacitor across uh, the uh, circuit, and that helps smooth out the direct current. However, there is another problem, because essentially you are throwing away half of the power which is coming from the wall, which is not very good. So to solve this problem, what we do is actually use what's known as a full wave rectifier, which is, has the following configuration. Now this thing looks pretty uh, complicated, but we're, we'll break this apart in a minute here to uh, show you exactly how this thing actually works. And the reason we're looking at this is because pretty much in any uh, AC to DC power supply that you have, um, uses one of these bridge rectifiers. So your computer power supply, uh, phone chargers, you know, they all have these objects um, in them. Uh, the diodes uh, are arranged in this following square configuration. Uh, the blue um, in this diagram is your alternating current source, which, again, like I said, is your 120 volts, 60 hertz, which comes from the wall. Uh, the arrows represent uh, which way the current is actually flowing during each part of the cycle, and we'll look at this um, in a minute here. Then we have the arrangement of the four diodes. Um, the output, the positive and negative parts, uh, get fed into a capacitor, which uh, smooths out the waveform and makes it uh, DC with very little ripple. Uh, additional electronics can be used to smooth this out further. Notice the purple dotted line, which is the waveform without the capacitor. That's essentially the absolute value of the sine wave and why this is actually a much better device than a single diode. Here we are using all of the power which is coming from the wall and not throwing away half like we were before. All right, now as for the individual cycles, we can look at them here. The arrow points in the direction the conventional current would be flowing. The green is at high voltage and the red is at low voltage. The green high voltage comes from the AC, goes through D1, um, then passes through your load, and your load is basically whatever you're running. So, you know, like if you're running a lamp or a heater or you're charging up something, so whatever it is. And then that becomes low voltage after it goes through the load and runs along the bottom where it goes up to D2 and then travels back to the AC source. The diodes which are dotted out uh, just don't participate in this phase of the cycle. Now you may be wondering, why doesn't the current travel up uh, the diodes between D2 and D1? I mean, the orientation is correct. However, the voltage at D1 is higher than the voltage at D2, so the current can't flow up those diodes. Essentially, like if you have a, a river, you can't, the water doesn't go up the waterfall, it only can go down the waterfall. So this was the positive portion of the uh, AC sine wave. Uh, now we look at the negative portion of the sine wave. Notice that D1 and D2 have been dotted out since they don't participate in this half. Uh, so the current is now uh, coming out of the bottom, right, because now we're in the opposite phase here. All right, it heads up uh, D3 and then through the load, and notice the current is traveling in the same direction through the load as it was in the previous graphic. Uh, this current is now at low voltage and continues to D4 where it goes back to the AC source. Again, it can't go through those dotted out diodes because the voltages are lower at D4 than at D3. So that was the negative portion of the sine wave. And here's the same graphic we started with, so hopefully you now have a better idea how this extremely important piece of technology actually works. All right, and next here we're going to look at the transistor. And the transistor is probably the most successful product ever made. Uh, to date, there are approximately 10 to the 20th transistors have been produced, or about 10,000 transistors for every ant alive on Earth. Uh, the vast majority are produced on computer chips. Uh, the best chips today have approximately 10 billion transistors on them, um, which have sizes around 30 nanometers, although you know there are even smaller ones um, available now as well. So why are transistors so important? Um, it's because they can act as an amplifier and as a switch. So if you ever saw the inner workings of a 1930s era radio, inside there were vacuum tubes. Uh, these tubes were bulky, they needed high voltage, and they burned out fairly quickly. They amplified the weak radio signals, so the radio would have enough power to actually make the speakers produce an audible sound. And also, early computers like the ENIAC uh, contained 17,468 vacuum tubes, which acted like switches to make an electronic Turing machine. Uh, the ENIAC was the size of a house and consumed about 150 kilowatts of power. Um, however, once they made the discovery of the transistor in 1947 by uh, John Bardeen, Walter Breton, and William Shockley, who got the Nobel Prize for this in 1956, 
Um, this made the current uh, digital age possible. Okay, so now we're going to look at the uh, transistor and specifically the bipolar junction transistor or it's commonly known as a BJT. Now there's three parts to uh, any transistor here, the collector, base, and emitter. Now generally when you're going to be seeing this, the collector is going to be at your positive voltage, your base is going to be basically your control voltage, and the emitter is going to be at the lower voltage, usually uh, ground. Although, you know, in circuits these things can definitely change, it all depends on exactly what you're using this for. So there's many variations um, upon these things here. All right, now there's two uh, basic types, there's the PNP and the NPN transistor. All right. And of course P and N just refers to the doping, you know, so is it P-type or N-type doped. So the transistor is basically designed uh, like this. So for the uh, PNP type of transistor we have here the collector attached to the P part, the base attached to the middle N part, and the emitter uh, connected to the end P part. The collector connected to the top N part, the base connected to the middle P part, and the um, emitter connected to the bottom end part. Now you may be wondering, you know, these look fairly symmetric, you know, are the emitter and collector really different? Yes they are, we'll uh, look at that um, in a little bit here. Alright, um, now the other thing is the uh, symbols. Um, so if you look at the electrical symbols in your electrical diagrams, what will you actually see? Okay, so these are the symbols that you would see in electrical circuit diagrams. So here, this is going to be your PNP transistor. This is your NPN transistor. So the way you can distinguish them is the direction of the arrows here on the um, emitter. Um, so anyway, the base is going to be in the middle, and this is essentially what's going to be controlling uh, the current and the voltage coming from the collector into the emitter um, in both of these cases. All right. Um, now, what is the difference here between PNP and NPN? Uh, well, for the uh, PNP, the holes are going to be your primary current carriers. Meanwhile, for the NPN, the electrons are going to be the primary current carriers. Remember, for the N-type silicon, the electrons are going to be the current carriers. For the P-type silicon, the holes are the current carriers. So, as you can see, we have NP, you know, the two N-types here. That's why the electrons are going to carry most of it. Meanwhile, over here, um, the P's has more holes, so this is why the holes are going to be the primary current carriers. Now, also, uh, you may also realize that this kind of looks a little bit like a diode in some respects, you know, between the base and the emitter, that's the diode, and yeah, if, if you want to, you can actually use uh, transistors um, in this orientation to uh, form a diode. However, um, that's fairly rare. Usually, you would just, you know, use a regular old diode in that case. Now, a couple other little things here is that uh, the current, um, you know, because this is going to be basically controlling current throwing through all of this stuff here, is that the uh, emitter current, so I is just representing current here, is going to be equal to the base current and the collector current. And the other thing to note is that the base current here is going to be much, much less than the collector current. All right, so essentially there's going to be a very small base current flowing into here, and this is going to be able to control a very large collector current coming out. And why this is useful is if you think of a hose, you know, to turn on a hose, you have a little uh, valve there, and basically by turning that little valve, you know, either closed or open, um, you can control large amounts of water flow with very little effort on your hand. That's essentially what this base is doing. You're putting very little current into here, and you're controlling large amounts of current actually going from the collector down to the emitter um, in these kind of cases. All right, so the main thing here is that very small base currents control large emitter currents. So essentially you just put a very small current into here. This controls large amounts of currents um, going through the, from the collector into the emitter. Um, and also, usually this is controlled because you put a voltage at the base. So you put some voltage into here, and again, there's just going to be a little current that flows. And then that is going to uh, control basically your current or your voltage actually going through your um, collector to your emitter here. Now remember I said over here that there's this, um, they look very symmetrical but there's actually an asymmetry going on here and there's uh, four basic characteristics when you're building a transistor about the collector and base emitter and their properties. So we'll just take a look at um, this right now. Alright, so these are the basic characteristics and just to draw this out so we can understand this a little bit more. So first of all, the base is physically thin, so this is you know, a more accurate drawing than when I you know, just drew it as three little blocks here. So you can definitely see the asymmetry now. So the base here is going to be physically thin. Uh, the emitter is going to be more heavily doped than the base. So, so you remember what we saw earlier when you heavily dope uh, the silicon, then the resistance goes way down, the conductivity goes way up. So here this is going to be uh, heavily doped than the base, so it's going to have a lower resistance over here. Uh, the collector is going to be physically larger than the emitter, so I just showed it um, like so. And also the emitter is more heavily doped than the collector, so if this is going to be lower resistance, this is going to be a higher resistance over here. Now why is this? 
So first of all, the reason that this is physically thin is because remember we're going to be basically having a lot of current going between our um, collector and our emitter here. And if you had a base which was actually much thicker, as the current was flowing from your collector down to your emitter, um, a lot of it would you know, very easily just say, well, hey, I'll just go into the base instead. That's you know, the faster off-ramp, right? Um, but if the, the base is physically thin, basically there's not a lot of area between um, the collector and the emitter, and most of the electrons, instead of like going into the base, actually get over here into the emitter side, and then once they're in this low resistance, they just keep on going. So this way you can get the current to basically flow this way with very little current actually going into the base area, which is highly desirable and what you actually want. So that's why um, that's over there. There's And the whole reason we also have um, this being a PNP junction, again, that goes back to your transistors. You need basically to put enough voltage into this to essentially uh, turn the uh, diode junction on, and then once that happens, um, the current's able to flow. Okay, so that's, again, why we actually have this PMP thing here. All right, the emitter is more heavily heavily doped than the base, and you know, as and the emitter more heavily doped than the base, this just continues on with this first one being physically thin, because once the um, electrons get into here, it's just going to keep on going. And the reason that the collector has to be physically larger than the emitter is because as the current flows through this region here, and remember, this is going to be high resistance, it's going to be dissipating a lot of power and getting very hot. And if this was a very small uh, location, it could get too hot, and then physically burn it out. So this um, large area and large volume here essentially helps it to dissipate a lot of energy, um, a lot of heat energy this way, um, without burning it out. And the emitter being much lower resistance, the electrons can basically flow through and not heat up the area, so this is why this can be um, um, much smaller there. And the reason that the emitter is more heavily doped than the collector is we want to avoid um, a reverse bias. Essentially when you turn on the base, you want it to, you know, the current to go this way and not to go up back towards the collector and turn it on the wrong way like that. I'll just show a simple little circuit here to uh, show you how this would kind of work. And there's two things that can be used as either an amplifier or a switch. Alright, so here we're basically just operating this as a switch. So um, if there's my positive 5 volts, which is you know, either turning it on or off, um, right here these are just resist resistor symbols. Um, and this is basically just to pull down um, the, the, uh, the, the voltage uh, once the switch is open. Because otherwise once I put the 5 volts on there, that could stay on there for a longer time and keep it open more than I want to. But if this is at ground, essentially if once I open the switch, this will bring this back down to ground. So that's just why that's there. Um, this is obviously just ground here. Um, so if um, this is open like it is in this configuration right now, um, this V out is going to be seeing the total plus 12 volts because it's going to drop across here. There's really going to be no current flowing unless you get anything going into the V out, although the, usually this is high impedance, so you don't worry about that. But essentially right now this transistor is turned off. So the voltage is you know, just going to be the plus 12 volts is what you're actually going to be reading. Now if I go here and close this switch, so I've gone here and now I'm closing this, so now that I've closed the switch, um, this is now going to be open. So basically your current is going to flow this way and your V out is actually going to go um, to zero. Okay, so that's going to basically go to zero because now this is essentially going to be near ground and your V out is just going to drop. All right, so this is essentially how it's acting as a switch. If this thing is open and you're getting a plus five volts here, um, we're going to be reading you know, like a plus 12 volts for the V out. If it's closed, like in this configuration, your V out is going to go to zero because this is um, going through there. Also, um, you know, as this opens up or closes, this can actually contr control very large current sources because now this current here is going to um, be essentially open up and it can travel through here, you know, turn on a heater, turn on a light bulb, whatever. This can essentially just turn on your load, um, what you're actually interested in. So this is how this, you know, actually acts as a switch. Um, the other thing is, you know, the same kind of a configuration here can act as a, uh, you know, amplifier for a signal. So if I have, you know, some kind of a signal coming in, you know, let's say your radio signal is coming into here, well, this signal is going to, you know, essentially turn on and off this transistor, you know, with the signal, you have to be, you know, capacitively coupled, a whole bunch of other things there, but essentially you got your signal coming in, this is going to oscillate, and now you're going to have your um, signal coming here, and then this can basically just uh, go, you know, like so. You'll have your little... Um, oscillation coming out on the other side. And where this is important is uh, think about you know, radios, you know, transistor radios, right? So if you have a transistor radio, you have a weak voltage signal coming in, which you pick up from your antenna, but that doesn't really have any current in it, right? So this has very low current. So essentially this is what we have on this side. So here we have voltage and low current. But on this side we have, you know, the high current. So essentially I'm putting in a voltage signal over here, and now this is getting amplified by this way by having a high current. So if you have your radio signal coming in from your antenna, 
you have some voltage there, but there's no way near enough current to run things like your speakers on the radio. So you can't actually listen to anything. On the other hand, um, once this goes through the transistor, now this is pulling large amounts of current. That amount of current can now you know, run you know, things like your speakers and everything. It basically acts as an amplifier. So, and remember that voltage times current is equal to power. Okay, this is one of those things they always tell you. Um, voltage times current is equal to power. So here I have this, this voltage, a low current, I'm now having you know, maybe a, a higher voltage, maybe a lower voltage, depends on your, on your, your circuit, um, but you're going to have much higher current here. So you basically amplified the power output from this. So you have a little tiny signal, gives you a larger signal in terms of your power, and that's how transistors you know, act as you know, amplifiers with that. And this is actually a control board that I found in um, one of these little uh, fan things. Somebody threw it out. It was the motor died there, but I just extracted the uh, little circuit board so you can kind of just get an idea what's uh, going on and identify some of these parts we've been looking at. So if I zoom in on this and see what we get. All right. So anyway, this is actually a pretty crappy board. It's only a one-sided board here, and their soldering job is actually kind of junky. But um, essentially, what we have here, here we have the voltage coming into here. Um, here is going to be your oops. So here we have the voltage coming in. You can actually read there ACL, which would be the line voltage. Um, ACN, which would be your neutral voltage on the blue there. Um, this passes through uh, this part here, which is going to be your fuse. And this right here is um, going to be a mob, a metal oxide varistor. Essentially, this uh, just prevents the voltage spikes. So um, the resistance actually changes um, as a uh, function of the voltage there. Uh, then anyway, this gets pulled through. Um, this little part right here is actually what's known as a triac. Uh, this is essentially just a switch for the, uh, the AC. Um, here's an inductor and a capacitor um, actually attached on there. And this little inductor capacitor with the resistor thing is actually just a thing to uh, prevent uh, voltage spikes from turning on your little triac right here. Um, here we have a switch. These are some resistors. Uh, right here, this little white chip. This is an opto um, isolator. So essentially there's a little LED with a little photodiode in there and this way you can basically optically isolate um, the electrical connections in your circuit. So essentially if you need to communicate any data, um, it basically blinks on one side and then the blinks are picked up on the other side, but there is no direct electrical connection between one side of the chip and the other. And this prevents you know, if there's any like little uh, spikes or something that can you know, screw up your... Uh, your stuff in there. Um, then of course we have a couple little um, integrated circuits. Now these have a whole bunch of transistors in here. This is just like a little 8-bit uh, processor. Um, this one over here is just like I believe a flip-flop chip. Um, and actually right here we have uh, some transistors. So right up here here's some transistors. So you got T1, T2, T3, T4, T5. So there's a whole bunch of little transistors in here. Um, of course right here these are the LEDs like so. So these are the LEDs. Um, here's a little egg segment display like so. Um, and then down here is actually uh, some of the diodes. So you can see right here there's a little diode and you can actually see there's a little bar right on that side. And then right above it here is actually um, a Zener diode. So that's the Zener diode. You can see ZD1 right there. And then we have a regular diode um, which is right over here. And then um, here we have some electrolytic capacitors um, like this um, as well and then some other. And these are just regular um, tantalum capacitors um, and they're able oh, ceramic capacitors for these. And um, that's basically about it. All right, and here's actually a nice little picture of Transistor Man. So if you pick up a copy of Horowitz and Hill, The Art of Electronics, um, you will find him in there. Um, also, they just came out with a third edition um, this year, so it's actually a pretty nice read there. There was no pause. He just kept talking in one long, incredibly unbroken sentence, moving from topic to topic so that no one had a chance to interrupt. It was really quite hypnotic.